association impacts positions. Attitudes can impact placement. And the way of life can impact longevity. Don't forget it. I'm a chosen generation. I'm a possessor of Christianity. I am what God says I am. I have what God says I have. And I can do what God says I can do. As I view myself in the mirror of God's word, I exercise abundance of grace and the fullness of Christ. I live in the world of possibilities and immortality. I'm a member of the God. So this is being 8th of August, 2021. I am still on blasting blessings. And when you look at that word blessing, it actually means a blessing that announces you. But remember, when you take, about, take out the first alphabet, B, you get a very interesting word again, lasting blessings. It is not every person that have got blessings that last. We say in this world uh, of men and we see a lot of things. The Bible says, do not envy the prosperity of wicked, of the wicked. He says, forget about it. It doesn't last long. So, that somebody around your neighborhood suddenly begin to buy fleets of cars and he does not respect God. Don't copy his lifestyle. Forget it. It doesn't last long. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 through 14. We'll begin our subject today, and I'm going to be dealing with positioning yourself for blasting blessings. Positioning yourself for blasting blessings. And some of the hearing me will say, how do I need to position myself? I'm already positioned in Christ. Remember, I'm your apostle of new Christian reality. I taught you about your position in Christ, but I also know that a man can actually move from his position by his lifestyle. I know a man can actually Step out of his position. The prodigal son was a son in the house. And one day she, he chose a strange land and moved to a strange land. At that moment, while he was in faraway country, was he still positioned in the house? Was he still relating with the father? So I don't want you to be like the energy of a fan, a ceiling fan that is switched off. When a ceiling fan is switched off, does it entirely go off immediately? It keeps turning. But don't be deceived. It has been disconnected from energy. Now, so don't look at a brother or a sister who doesn't take God serious. And because they don't take God serious, the person, oh, he's living well. He's okay. He just bought a new car. Is he always in church? Is he not building a house? Is he always in church? Does he even have all this time? Why are we making it so difficult? The flesh will always think that serving God is difficult. Until you yield and crucify the flesh, you can't serve God. Why do you think Jesus said when he said, take up the cross and follow me? It is because there's a part of us that think that this thing we do is difficult. He thinks that we are suffocating ourselves. That part of us that crave for a freedom that doesn't exist, a freedom that destroys. The Bible said there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end is destruction. I thank God for Galatians chapter 3, verse number 13 and 14. The Bible says, Christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law, being made a cause for us. Christ redeemed us from the cause of the law, by being made a cause for us. For it is written, cause is everyone that hanged on a tree. This is beautiful. Looking at it from the Jewish perspective, you may think it's only the Jews that were under a curse. But when you look at it from a generic perspective, you will remember that an incident occurred in the book of Genesis, chapter number three. And that incident was when man reached out his hands to disobedience to God. And the Bible said there was a consequence for that action. There was a consequence. God said the day you eat of this tree, you will die. So man suddenly left the garden of Eden to the garden of course. If there's any garden that cause could create, but I want to say the wilderness of course. 
He left the garden of Eden to the wilderness, of course. He didn't actually die immediately. It took him about 930 years. But the Bible says, a thousand years is as a day in the sight of God. So, after 930 years, that man is going to die. And what do we see after that? We saw man deteriorate because cause begin to take more effect. Sometimes, a cause on a man doesn't take so much effect on the man as it will take on his seeds. And you are Christians, that is why I need to teach you deeply. Some of the things that the children or those who came after the man who brought that idol into a family suffer are worse and more than even the one that brought the idol. He lived. What happened? Because it takes time for God to take effect. But when it takes effect, it works so quickly that you begin to wonder how the other people that live with that cause were able to cope with it. And that is exactly what all happened to Adam. And that is what has happened to you today, where we see people are living to 70 and they're celebrating it. At 80, people write celebration of life. 80 is supposed to be untimely death. That is according to the Bible. But man is celebrating life at 80. One of these days, I'm going to be discussing the cycle of human age and how it deteriorated. From men living to 900 to men living to 400. From men living to 400 to men living to 100 and something. Until God placed a benchmark in Genesis 6-3. He said, okay, any which way, my message should keep man to 120. But in the book of um, Sam, we saw the King David begin to talk. That even after God had said 120, man hardly gets past 70. And he said, at 70, man should celebrate and negotiate with God. But that's not God's statement for us. So we saw people living and that and living like that. And we live in a time where human mortality has become something that is almost a norm. You could just hear that a man just died at 45, a man just died at 50. That even your neighbor is living as though he's going to die tomorrow. But these were the things Christ went to the cross for. The moment Jesus Christ was nailed on that cross, every judgment that was against man was put on the cross. So when we read Galatians 3 verse 13, he said all of the judgment that would have been against us has been nailed to the cross by the death of Christ. The moment he hung on a tree, that's the worst cause. That's a cause, the abominable cause. That's how the Romans crucified the criminals. But to the Jews, is a cause for someone to hang on a tree. Because a tree is life. And then someone hanging on that tree is a cause because he dies with the death of a tree. The death by hanging is an abominable death. It means you must have committed a very big crime for you to die by hanging. It means God has rejected you. Man has also rejected you. The earth has rejected you. So, Jesus took the highest form of cause so that the man who thinks his cause is the greatest can be able to realize the extent the love of God went. We have always studied Galatians, we see. To know what is the length, the breadth, the depth, and the height of the love of God. He went as far as taking the worst death. So that the worst man, the worst sinner, if there's anything like that, can be the righteousness of God. So he said in verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might be upon the Gentiles. Oh, so it's not just about the Jews. But all he did in 13 was to cut across to the Gentiles. So how does the cause of the tree concern the Gentile? The cause of the tree is more as in more significant to the Gentiles because we got to look from Genesis, not from Numbers. When we look from Numbers, we are going to see the fiery serpent hanging on a tree. And we understand the cause of a tree. But when we read from Genesis, we see that man was ostracized from the garden of Eden by the fruit of a tree. 
So it requires, man requires the fruit of a tree to be brought back to the garden of God. And there was a fruit that God is going to offer man from a tree. And that is his righteousness. So when Jesus hung on the cross, he made him to be seen who knew no sin. And a fruit, a, a, a fruit was reached out for by God. And he took it. And he made us the righteousness of God. So that's beautiful. That becomes the first pointer that everyone born again is blessed. And that is why for us who are Christians, the cross means so much to us. Though we have been positioned by this blessing, the believer can also put himself at disadvantage by his lifestyle. So when you read the epistles, you see how much the Bible harmonizes the blessing with us. The Bible also begins to emphasize on lifestyles. Have you forgotten the book of 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14? Where the Bible says, be not of equally yoked together with unbelievers. And you read the striking words in this last discourse in chapter 6 of the book of Corinthians. Where he said, come out from among them. Come out from among them. Why would God go to that extent? Because he knows that one can be at disadvantage right in the midst of the blessings by lifestyle. So I want you to take note of that. The lifestyle of a man can actually keep him at disadvantage even though he is in the midst of blessings. I know I've had some Christians. It's good, beautiful to be academical, but it is more beautiful to be wise. They say, since I'm blessed, I cannot be cursed. Clap for yourself. It's true. But the one who blesses you have the right to also withhold his blessing. So we can position ourselves in a place where the blessing will no longer be at work in our life. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, there's something the Bible talked about, and it is maybe not a discourse. We see it significantly posted and poised in different passages of the Bible. But that's the only place that word was used in the Bible. He said, if you will not hear and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, said the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you. I will curse your blessings. Meaning, God went to the essence and said, if I give it to you, and you decide not to ascribe it to me, he said, I will curse your blessings. Now, this passage of the Bible is for those who are wise. I don't preach to every kind of person. Those who have come of age in the Christian faith become wise. You now understand what is a cost blessing? When a man gather and another eats it, that is a cost blessing. When a man labor and is a labor of fool, he's working so hard, seeing nothing to show forth for it. That's a cost blessing. When a man harvests and in the time to celebrate his harvest, he's cut off. That is a cost blessing. So when you see it in our society today, don't say, who knows tomorrow? Let me just eat my money the way I have to eat it because I don't know what will happen to me. There's nothing that is supposed to happen to you if you as a believer stay right where you are supposed to stay. We only expose ourselves to these cost blessings by some kind of ungodly an unholy lifestyle. So, touch your neighbor and say, your lifestyle imparts on your blessing. And somebody say, who is blessed, is blessed. Now, we just read the Bible. Whatever your opinion is, is okay for you, but don't be foolish in your own way. One of the things we do is expose ourselves to the word of God and stay wise with the word of God. The blessing can also increase. If we read the book of Peter, the Bible talks about grace that is already given, being multiplied. It means the blessing can also increase. Oh, the blessing reminds us of the story and the parable of the kingdom of God that Jesus likened to be a yeast. And he said the yeast in a particular environment did not multiply. The yeast moves to another environment and it occupies everywhere. It spread Blasting blessing is spreading blessings. When the blessings upon your life begins to spread. It is not people travel and come back after 10 years, they meet you in the same place. 
they meet you with the same struggle, with the same level of life. It's called spreading blessing. Hallelujah. Are you having a good time with me? So, somebody said, but now I have the righteousness of God in my life. But do you remember the parable of the marriage feast in Matthew 22, where Jesus talked about the kingdom? And he said, he, wished, he reached out to the people it was meant for, and they killed his messengers, talking about how the Jews crucified our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he went on to discuss with us and said, then he said, go to the highway and reach those who are never called my people. You remember that the people he never called his people are the other nations, which we are. So he reached out to all of us. But the Bible says, in the midst of the celebration, one man decided not to change his garments, but he was in the kingdom. A particular man, a particular individual, he decided, see, I'm, I'm going to live the kind of life I am living. I am going to be in this church, and nobody has the right to control me or to contain me. I am the one that is going to contain myself in every church, there are members who are pastors to themselves. They don't submit to pastor. They go to church for camouflage. They want the name of the church, but they don't want the lifestyle that the church teaches. It must not be your portion in Jesus' name. So the Bible said that this man decided to dress himself, robe himself in another garment. And something happened in the Bible. The Bible said that God looked at this particular one who decided that his garment is going to be different. And he said unto him, friend, how come is that? Meaning, he has already extended a relationship with him. Both of them have a relationship now. He has received the righteousness of God. My message today, like many people have asked me, say, the way you talk presently looks a little bit different from how we're used to you. I said, yes, because even every prophet has a transformation time. When your time goes, your metamorphosis, you move from how you were before to how God wants you to address his people at different intervals. There was a way I was to address you before. There's a way I am to address you now. And actually, I'm not more concerned about styling after other preachers. I just want to be happy that I say to you that which God exactly put in my mouth to say to you. Because for this reason was I sent to you. And he said unto him, friend, how come is thou in here not having a wedding garment? So he entered. How did he enter? How did he enter? He entered. And he had no garments. The Bible says he was speechless. And look at what happened. The next verse. Then said the king to the servants, bind him and them food. Take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That shouldn't be your position in Jesus' name. I say that shouldn't be your position in the name of Jesus. Christianity has got its culture. It's got its culture. We don't culture Christianity. We actually acclimatize to the culture of Christianity. We don't change it. No, we reposition ourselves for it to change us. Hallelujah. Don't always live for yourself. Don't be satisfied that you have matured. Always think about improving yourself. You see, satisfaction makes you feel like, hey, it's okay, what matters? Think about improving yourself. If you notice that you are celebrating an unusual kind of satisfaction, check your association. Because if you are around those who think everything is done, you will begin to think like that. You will no longer see yourself promoting certain vices that will help you. And you see the things that were called pornography before are things that newspapers naturally publish now. I mean news that are horrible to the hearing of the ears. A newspaper, I mean they recognize tabloids in your country, publish them online with pictures. You know, sometimes it is difficult to teach your children how to go to news. 
it is difficult for them to read news because before you know it, they are getting to know the things you never wish they should know at that age because knowledge, if not controlled, can turn you into a monster. So when we begin to look at it, we begin to learn so much. There are attitudes, ways of life, associations that one that wants to remain in the blessings must keep away. There are attitudes, ways of life, associations that one that wants to remain in the blessings must learn to keep away. Everybody, everything cannot be in your life. You want to remain in the blessing? There are attitudes that you will keep away from. There are ways of life that you must keep away from. There are associations that you must keep away from. Read the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. The Bible says, Wherefore, we being surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, it said, Let us therefore Lay aside. So it is not written to unbelievers. Everything doesn't go with God. God is not a king of lawlessness. The kingdom of God is not a kingdom of lawlessness. There are things that we must lay aside. I want us to take a close look from a woman in the Bible. This woman is in the life of Jacob. This woman happened to be the most loved wife of Jacob. Her name is Rachel. She has come into the patriarchal order. By that, she has become a matriarch. But there's something that is going to be wrong with her. She wants to stay in this blessed atmosphere with her old life. The implication was hazardous. But as we look at it, it is not for us to sing a ballad. It is for us to learn a lesson and be able to make a correction in our life from what we see in other people's lives. Association impacts positions. Don't forget it. Attitudes can impact placement. Don't forget it. And the way of life can impart longevity. Don't forget it. There are people whose way of life has so imparted their longevity. I was listening to a man who talked about how much he drank. And the doctors told him that he may not have to live long again because he actually has weakened his liver. Now somebody will say, the Bible says, even if we eat any deadly thing, it shall not hurt me. Thank you for quoting the Bible like a pig. The Bible says that don't give precious things to a swine. A pig quoted holy word for unholy lifestyle. You should never be like that. So, we begin to look at this person. Why Jacob left the father in law with the wives? Even after all the signs Rachel saw, she stuck to the father's shrine. How can somebody who has been exposed to God, you have had one miracle or the other in your life, you still want to hold on to some ungodly lifestyle? You don't have any conviction one day that. What you are is God that made it to you. You feel yes. Even if I salute God, he should leave me to have my life. Do you not read that the Bible says that if one died for all, it says so that those who live will no longer live for themselves. Do you think you are the only person that wants or have a desire for excesses? All of mankind sometimes desire excesses. But there's something that can keep us from that excess. It's called the fear of the Lord. The reverence that there's one who is an overseer of your life makes you, even when you wander away, to wander back and say, I'm sorry, sir. 
I'm sorry, Lord. And that is one thing that we should always hold on to. Rachel was not like that. What was Rachel's life like? Let us look at even her blessing in Genesis 30, verse 22. Genesis 30, 22 was the first time Rachel is about to encounter the hand of God. The Bible says, and God remembered Rachel and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. So, in Genesis 30, verse 22, we just saw that Rachel could talk to God and God could hear. That's enough blessing. Enough blessing. I'm not even talking about opening her womb or any other thing that happened. The fact that you can talk to God and God can hear you is enough blessing. That could have been enough reason to respect him. Remember, imagine someone getting access to a place that is difficult for people to get access. And when you get there, you begin to mess who give you access. That was exactly what we're going to see in Rachel's life. Rachel was that pretty damsel that could make a, a patriarch to spend 14 years of his life waiting for a woman. I mean, seven years after he served, he became a servant to inherit her. I want to tell you how, how inviting and attractive Rachel was. Because I don't know any man here that is ready to submit his life and lose seven years of his life with a woman. You saw a woman and you said, I'm going to lose seven years. Today is 2021. I'm ready to keep everything post to 2028 to wait for the woman. Which man here? Now, it is so interesting and that we can rarely find such a man today that is going to pause his life to wait for a woman. Or would you? Not me, I won't. So, but this man paused his life to wait for a woman. And after seven years, he was told, given another woman. And he said, huh? Seven years? This is not the woman I served for. You know what he's going to do? He goes in again for another seven years. Fourteen years. Let me tell you, he's waiting for a woman for 14 years. The woman he saw 14 years ago is not going to look the same way after 40 years. So I want you to understand a whole lot of things because it's easy to just think it. But you are seeing it from the man's perspective. Look at it from the woman's perspective and keep the woman for 14 years. From the time she was in her prime when our dear great great grandfather Jacob saw. Fourteen years has passed, and after fourteen years, the woman is not looking the same. But this man goes after the woman. And the funniest thing of all was that this woman was not even in the will of God. We are later going to find out. Do you think that God actually built his empire? around the house of Rachel. God's going to build his son from the house of Lee. But when I say somebody is not in the will of God, is that somebody all his life works against God's will. The will of God is not air condition. The will of God is not car. The will of God is not children. The will of God is is that God is honored in our life. When somebody lives in dishonor to someone that loves him, makes the one he, that loves him an enemy all his life, that is to say that the person is not in the will of God. So when I say Rachel is not in the will of God, I say she is not in the will of God because of the lifestyle she projected all through her life. Now, let us look at something very exciting about Rachel. Genesis chapter 31, verse 19 to 35. We see Rachel begin to carry out her assignment or the kind of life, the thing she promotes, the thing she feels she represents. This is our family heritage. This is what I should be. 
The Bible says, and Laban went to shear his sheep. And Rachel had stolen the images that were her father's. She didn't steal one shrine. She stole all the shrine. I mean, you are following a man that have another God. And I thought you just gave your heart to the man. But also, you want to come with your own God. Do you know how many times Christians are in the church with their own God? Which are you? Those who look at their bank account and say, I'm all right. You are all right because you don't know that the rich also cry. That money cannot save a man the day the devil comes after him. is God. Satan does not fear money. Always know it. That's what we saw. Rachel stole the father's images and was living in the blessing with the images of the father. The next verse. So he fled with all that he had and he rose up and passed over the river and set his face towards the Mount Gilead. 22. And it was told Laban that on the third day that Jacob was fled. Verse 23. And he took his brethren with him and pursued after him seven days' journey. And they overtook him in the Mount Gilead. Verse 24. And God came to Laban, the Syrian, in a dream by night, and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. So even while Lee was uh, Rachel was carrying the shrine. God was still protective of Jacob. God always stands by the blessed. But that shouldn't be a reason for you to live anyhow. Look at what happens next. Then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountain. And Laban with his brethren pitched in the mountain of Gilead. The next verse. And Laban said to Jacob, What hast thou done that thou hast stolen away on our ways to me and carried away my daughters as captives, taken with a sword? The next verse. Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly and steal away from me and did not tell me that I might have sent thee away with maid and with songs, with tabrets and with herb? Verse 28. And has not of suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Thou hast now done foolishly in so doing. Verse 29. It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. But the God of your father spake unto me yesterday. You know sometimes the blessings of God can work in our life. Because of the kind of fathers we have. Spiritual covering. But that is not to say that the blessing will consistently work even when we are working against it. Look at what happens. Saying, take heed that thou speak not to Jacob either good or bad. Verse 30. And now thou wouldest need be done because thou saw longest after thy father's house. Yet wherefore has thou stolen my God? New King James Version. Then Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said, Perhaps you would take your daughters from me by force. So I actually ran from you. I didn't tell you I was leaving because I was afraid. So they made amends then. The next verse uh, With whomever you find your ghost, do not let him leave. In the presence of our brethren, Identify what I have of yours and take it with you. For Jacob did not know that Rachel has stolen them. Look at the next verse. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, into Lee's tent, and into the two maids' tent. But he did not find them. Then he went out of Lee's tent and entered Rachel's tent. You know, Laban really loved Rachel so much. And Rachel was the one he wants to keep in the house. 
with all custom. So Rachel got so used to, see, don't by emotion submit to idolatry. Idolatry is idol worship. Anything that turns your attention away from God and can decide how long you should spend in church, how long you should stay in the house of God, whatever it is, is an idol you have decided to worship. Don't, out of emotions and love, turn to idolatry. Verse 34. Now Rachel had taken the household idols, put them in the camel's saddle, and sat on them. And Laban searched all about the tent, but did not find it. I want to read it in message translation. You're going to understand it. But Rachel had taken the household goats, put them inside a camel cushion, and was sitting on them. When Laban had gone through the tents, searching high and low, Without finding eighteen, he has them wrapped up. This big cushion uh, wrapped with her clothes, and then she's sitting, and the idol was right there, and they couldn't find it. You can't tell her to get up. She's direct. Then look at the next verse. Rachel said to her father, "Don't think I'm being disrespectful, my master, that I can't stand before you." But I'm having my period. Look at how fast she could go. So even though he turned the place upside down in his search, he didn't find the household gods. Let's see what's going to happen. Let's look at the end of Rachel. We read it so that we all could learn. Genesis 35 verse 9. To 19. And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padanaram and blessed him. The same. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called anymore Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. And kings shall come out of thy loins. The next verse. And the land which I give, gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. Verse 13. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. 14. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And they poured a drink offering thereon, and they poured oil thereon. Verse 15. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. Verse 16. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Euphrates. Euphrates. And Rachel traveled, New King James Version, and Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had her hard labor. Now, this is the first time we are going to see a matriarch having hard labor. And this also happened to be the last time. This is the only record of a woman in the Bible that died giving birth. And this is going to be the first and last of that record. Even in the book of Isaiah, he said that we will not die giving birth. In the book of Exodus, he's going to tell them no woman have the right to die giving birth. But this is the only woman that died giving birth. The next verse, verse 17. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear, you will have this son also. The next verse. And so it was as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni. But his father called him Benjamin. I've talked about it. Verse 19. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath. That is Bethlehem. How come Rachel didn't get to Bethlehem? For every blessing God has given you, 
The blessing is only taking you to a place of monumental blessing. Bethlehem in the Bible is significant of monumental blessing. But the small one that she saw, she held on to what she's not supposed to hold. We are in a season that God is lifting the members of this church up. But there are things that must be put aside. When you look at yourself, you ask yourself, what is it that you are holding on to that has become a God to you? That is challenging the position of the Lord Almighty in your life. What is it that you are holding up to that has become a decider to when you will come to choir rehearsals or not? Whatever you make a God, you become a servant too. Is there even anything that is worth calling a God over your soul? There's only one being that is worth being your God. That's your mighty God. Please, rightly put away whatever has become something you pick up that is challenging the place of God in your life. That's actually my discourse with you this morning. You're blessed in Jesus' name. Trust that you've been blessed by this broadcast. To order for the complete series of this message, please call the numbers now displayed on your screen. If you have not received Jesus into your heart, you can do so now as you repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner. I believe you died to save me and was raised up for my justification. I declare you the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life because I believe. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, congratulations, you are now born again. You can advance in your spiritual walk with God as you fellowship with any faith-based church around you. Usher with us at Salvation Gospel Mission International Headquarters, number 10 to Waysapa Street, off Naval Sirota, Salva Delta State, Nigeria. Salvation Gospel Mission International.